Hi there. My name's Graham Devine from Magic Leap. I am the chief game wizard at Magic Leap. And so today, I want to talk to you about mixed reality. And I was going to give this whole talk about mixed reality and how it affected education and what education would be like and so forth. And then I thought, do people really know what mixed reality actually is? What we're actually thinking at Magic Leap about it? So I thought, well, I, I should step back here because I don't know anything really about education. I'm here to learn that. But I can tell you all about mixed reality and what we think it's going to do or how we think it's going to change things. So let's do that. So the only reason to give a speech is to change the world. <laughs> and I always remember this because you're all out there and I don't want to waste your time. <laughs> um, so hopefully, let's change the world with the speech. So we have this handy dandy definition which happens to be written by me <laughs> of mixed reality is the mixture of the real world and virtual worlds so that one understands the other. This creates experiences that cannot possibly happen anywhere else. And this I consider to be one of the most important aspects of mixed reality. It's very easy to make augmented reality apps that would be better on an Xbox or better on an iPad or better on a smartphone. It's very hard to think about what a mixed reality application actually is. So we have these things that go through kind of virtual reality. Virtual reality, you put it on a large headset, you are taken somewhere else. I am flying a Viper in Battlestar Galactica, and it is awesome. But you are somewhere else. You can't see your body. Augmented reality. Augmented reality has been around for a long, long time. And augmented reality doesn't really understand the world that you're in. It overlays banners on top of that, but it doesn't actually interact with the world directly. And then we have mixed reality, which understands I can walk behind a podium. I can put digital things behind this podium. I can understand that this is a computer in front of me. I can understand the world and interact with it directly. And so mixed reality is very different than augmented reality, very different than virtual reality. So who am I? I've been making video games for around 40 years, since the 1970s. My first computer was a TRS-80, which I'm sure was around before most of you were even born. In fact, I've been around longer than most of you. <laughs> um, so why am I here? What do I do at Magic Leap? Um, I'm here because I, I help Magic Leap think about the future. I help Magic Leap think about what content's going to be like in the future. And so I think about that in three kind of ways. I think about a lot of things in three kind of ways. I think about mixed reality in, kind of in two years once, you know, once mixed reality starts to come out. There's still a lot of devices with atoms. There's still TV sets, there's still smartphones, there's still iPads, there's still all these things around. But we're starting to have these mixed reality devices come into play and how are they being used? What are they doing with these things that still have atoms? And then I think five years into the future, when it's, you know, 50-50, mixed reality devices and devices that have atoms. And now we have a lot more mixed reality going on, fewer devices with atoms. What's that like socially? What's that like to actually play games in that? What's that like to communicate like that? And now I think 10 years into the future, when the world is mixed reality, and instead of me coming to New York, I'm standing in my house giving this presentation, and I can see you all wherever you're at in the world, and we're having a mixed reality presentation that's just photons. Atoms are no longer required. And that's a huge change. It's a huge social change. But we have to think about it in steps. You can't just jump to stage three and say, hey, you know, we don't need atoms anymore. It, it, it needs to be considered along the way. So how am I helping ship the product? I think about guiding people through that and what games are like and what we do. I'm chief game wizard. I've made games for a long time. I made you know, a Halo game. I made a game called Quake 3. I made a seventh guest game. I made all these games of CD-ROM and so forth. And so I try to help people think about what the next kind of games will actually be, what the next kind of content will actually be, what each of the applications will actually be like. And so I start that, as I start all things, with my obituary. I encourage everyone to write your obit now because it is incredibly difficult to write it when you're dead. <laughs> and I've not practiced that. I don't know that for sure, but I'm going to guess. Your obituary is your life. And if you want your life to be wonderful, if you want your life to make a difference, if you want your life to change, then you should write your obituary right now. 
and write down on it, I made a difference in the world, I changed the world, I was a good father, my daughter loves me, and all those things. Because if you don't do it now, you'll never guide your life towards that. And so the earlier you can write your obituary, the better chance you will have of actually achieving it. Seems like a bit weird. And th this is the gravestone that I want, by the way. I, I tell this to my wife the whole time. Of, this is the, so I tell this to everyone so eventually I can get it. Because when you go to a graveyard in 100 years' time and you see that, you're going to walk over to it and say, who the hell is this Graham Devine guy? <laughs> I, don't want, I, I want atoms for that. <laughs> so I try to think of what is the... That for a company, what's that for Magic Leap? Because an obituary is not a very good thing to write for a company. And so I came up with WWWS. What will Wired say? <laughs> and I think about that in the different years. I think about that in 2016. And fortunately, we know what Wired says in 2016 now. <laughs> um, they wrote a whole freaking article on Magic Leap. And it was... It could have gone two ways, though. It could have been Magic Leap. Oh, my gosh, it's just pie in the sky. It's not really real. Or it could have been what they wrote of, oh, my gosh, it was incredible. I've never seen anything like that. It's going to change computing. There's two ways that article could have gone. In 2018, what's it going to be like? Is that article going to say, oh, Magic Leap, they're just a one device wonder. They're on their way out. Or is it going to say, Magic Leap, oh, my gosh, you know, changing the way we perceive computing. More and more mixed reality, things are just wonderfully changing. And then I think about 2020 and, and, and beyond. And there's two things here that I, 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 that I tell people about Magic Leap. Magic Leap should be thought about as a company that makes flying cars. You know, yes, mixed reality is important. Yes, I'm here to talk about mixed reality. Magic Leap as a company is here to help humans and here to make a difference for humanity. And so in 2020, if we're making flying cars, awesome, but we should also be you know, converting the world to mixed reality and making more things about mixed reality. So I think a lot about that future and that progression. And so mixed reality must be the wide article we dream about. So that's, I think about that in ways, you've really got to have faith. Because there's nothing I can show you here today that proves any of this, that says the world's going to change in 10 years. There's nothing going to change things the way they are. And it's not this kind of faith. <laughs> it's faith faith. And so I'm here to, you know, to, you know, to plead with you to, to understand that this change is happening. And you've got to have faith that we are on a path to mixed reality. And that we are going to be changing the world. And so when it comes to mixed reality, I think about four pillars. Well, four pillars is a bad word. I think about four types of software. I think about games. I think about gaming and mixed reality and what it actually means. I think about consuming media and what consuming media is actually like. And what's it like to take you know, in, in, in Netflix and what's it like to take in all these things and what's it like to actually view things. I think about communication. What's it like to talk to someone else in mixed reality? What's it like to have that conversation? How would I actually do that? What's the best way to go do that? And I think about information. What's it like to have information presented to me in this device? What's it like to have information given to me? What, you know, what should that be like? How should the, the, those photons invade my eyeballs? So let's talk about each of those a little bit. Let's talk about games. Now games, I consider there to be two games today that actually work well in mixed reality. That is Lego, real Lego, and how to host the murder games. And the reason for that is both those games understand your living space. You build the Lego over the couch, and that the couch up there becomes the landing pad for the helicopters, and then in comes a space shuttle from below, and you do all these wonderful things. And it uses your environment. It uses your living room or your bedroom. It, 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 I still play with Lego, so it's my living room, sorry. Um, and how to host a murder actually happens in, in your own home and actually has things where you're setting up actors and saying, hey, neighbor guy, you know, you're going to be the murderer. Uh, not in real life. But. So I think a lot about games. And I think about games and how they are existing right now in augmented reality. And a year ago, if you Googled augmented reality gaming, this was the first picture that came up. 
Did anyone here write this? I've got, I've, I have two problems with this application. I'm going to go into them. So I, I, I try not to offend anyone, but I'm going to have to go through two problems that I have. First problem is it has what I call a virtual D-pad on a screen, which means it's, it, it has this screen, this touch screen, and they're emulating a joystick on it. And I used to work at Apple. I, I, I worked on Apple on the iPad and the iPhone, gaming on the iPad and iPhone. And I worked there on the iPhone, the second iPhone was just coming out, the iPhone 3G. And game developers would come to me and they'd say, Graham, your device is going to fail miserably unless you add a joystick. Unless that home button becomes like a, like a joystick on the PSP, we are not going to make games to your device. It is going to be terrible. You, you're going to fail. And I was like, no, game developer, you have this beautiful touch screen. You have this beautiful device in front of you that's from the future. <laughs> the world is on the other side of this piece of glass. And you can interact almost directly with it. You can touch into that world. It's incredible. And the game developers at the time were like, no, no. We need a joystick, really. And so games will come out with this virtual D-pad on it. And all this says to me is, hey, my game is going to be better on a 3DS or a PSP. It does not say my game is going to be awesome on an iPhone, because it's not using a touchscreen. But now, if you go to any game developer in 2016, of course, it's all touch. The game industry moved on. We understand now that touch is the interface. Touch is awesome. You know, every single game uses touch well. We all learned to move on and adapt away from touchscreens. The second thing this does is it's using augmented reality to place those rock and sock and robots on there. But the gameplay is actually worse because of the augmented reality aspect of this game. The gameplay would be better if they didn't actually have that augmented reality system in there. I mean, it shows, it shows the system off well. It shows off augmented reality, sticking things to the pixels in the ground, putting things in front of you. But it's, the game would actually be improved elsewhere. This would be a better game on a PSP or an Xbox One or you know, just, not having, not, just not using a camera. It's not really using mixed reality well. A mixed reality game understands the world that you're actually in, uses the space effectively, uses you know, thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to build my castle in the corner of my room because it's more defendable than, than, than the middle of the room. All those kinds of things, as well as understanding these are wooden cubes I have in front of me with letters on them that read them. Fortunately, the game industry has shown that it can change, not only with touch, but it changed dramatically in the 1990s. How many of you remember Super Mario 64? It's, I realize now when I, give, you know, when I talk about Super Mario 64, a lot of people, it's before their time. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's not good. Um, Super Mario 64 changed the game industry more or less overnight. There had been 3D games before then. There had been a few um, that had come out, but there had been no 3D puzzle game, jump game like that. Super Mario before that was two-dimensional. Almost all games are two-dimensional. They were flat running games that, you, you know, that had puzzles on them. They were flat running jumping games and they had puzzles inside them. The game industry as a whole felt that 3D on a, on a console would be hard for the user to comprehend, hard for the user to control. That Mario character would be non-controllable, let alone understand the puzzle of the level in front of them. You know, to go and jump on this platform or go down a pipe or go do these things. So the game industry didn't try to adapt to 3D, didn't try to move into 3D. The camera controls weren't right. Nothing was, you, you can't have a mouse keyboard, um, you know, to, to do any kind of 3D. Console 3D was very, very hard. But Mario 64 changed all that. It proved 3D puzzles could be incredible. 3D puzzles could be fun. 3D puzzles could be you know, quite interesting. They could, they could scale from the easy to the hard. And so the game industry moved on from being two-dimensional to being three-dimensional. And really, since then, it's stuck there. It's 2016 now. It's you know, 25 years later. And we're still making 3D puzzle games like this. Sometimes we give you guns now. Uh, sometimes we do puzzle games still. Really, the graphics are more awesome. I'll give you that, the graphics are absolutely incredible. But really, we have not moved gaming on as a platform. But we have to. Mixed reality will change the way that we actually do things. And mixed reality games need to move from games from being behind a screen, where you interact with another world completely via a joystick, to being in your world with you. And that is a very different type of game, and the game industry will move on. 
So mixed reality games will inspire and delight the audience. So media, I think about Netflix an awful lot because Netflix falls into that two, five, 10 year problem. Um, and I think about what that means because right now, if I watch Netflix, I'm about two seconds away from enjoying Jessica Jones on my couch. I'm sitting there and I turn my TV on, Netflix, Jessica Jones, good to go, beer in hand. And my wife's sitting there and we're watching it and enjoying it. It's awesome. So what's the mixed reality version of that? What's the mixed reality version that, that, that's better? Why would I possibly wear a mixed reality device to watch Netflix? In 10 years time, it's easy because I don't have a TV set anymore. I'm just gonna watch Netflix that way. But in two years time, what's that gonna be like? What's that gonna be? And so I, I think back to like the 1980s and 1990s when there was people going out to the woods and only one person had a GPS unit. You know, now we all have GPS. We all have, you know, we all have GPS. But back then, one person had a GPS unit. And that GPS unit was, you know, you liked that person. Because <laughs> they knew where you were. <laughs> and so what's the GPS person approach to this? Well, the other thing I do when I watch Netflix is my wife and I watch it together. And we're like, who's that actor? What was TV show was they in? What movie was they in? It was just, when's the next episode? What's the premise? And the next reality has the ability to give you that buddy application where it's seen as a good thing. My wife will look at me when I have on the, you know, on a mixed reality headset and say, oh, thank God Graham's wearing it. He, he can now tell me all the information we don't have to try and look, look it up on an iPad. It's actually a socially you know, good thing that I'm wearing that. So I think about that as being kind of imp important because the only way that you can bring mixed reality into the world, where, you know, two years after the device is out, when it's, when it's seen is if I'm wearing it on stage or a few of you are wearing it in the audience, it's got to be, Thank God Graham is wearing this device because now I'm going to have a better talk. If it's Graham is wearing this device, oh my God, it's creeping me out. We've failed as an industry. We've failed completely. It needs to be the thank God. Only way that we can, only way that mixed reality will work is if it's, uh, is if people accept it socially. And so the benefit to it has to be seen by both people, both the wearer and the observer or someone wearing it. Netflix has that, you know, we have that, that I, you have GPS thing for Netflix, and we think about that an awful lot on that path forward. And so mixed reality will be the better and preferred source for media consumption. So communication, talking to people. Communication is very interesting because I gauge it into four age groups. I, you know, I think about my parents who are in their 80s and how they communicate with one another. They like to talk to each other face to They will actually drive from England, from southern England, all the way to Scotland to just talk to their family. Face-to-face -face conversation is what they like. They're prepared to spend eight hours in a car to go talk to someone. Or on a telephone. Those are the two ways they like to communicate. They don't use Snapchat. They don't use text messages. They don't really use Skype. They don't use anything else. They like to talk to people face-to-face -face or on a phone. And that's kind of seen as the way that they communicate with each other. And then the th I think about people in my age group. I think about, well, I'll use Skype. You know, I'll use you know, the, you know, instant messaging. I'll, I'll use these things to, you, to communicate electronically in email. I'll communicate that way. And I'll start to use electronics. And then I think about my daughter, who's 21. And she uses Snapchat, and she's very used to avatar presence in games, and she's very used to you know, all these very small and fast ways to communicate electronically. The phone and face-to-face -face is, boy, that's like a long way off for her in terms of preferred communication. She wants some sort of fast communication. It's vastly different than any generation is used to. But avatar presence is acceptable to her as a form of communication. And then I think about the generation that follows that, who are six and seven right now, and how different their world is than mine. When I was growing up, photographs were not free. Photographs cost money. And you had maybe 36 of them a summer. And then you'd, you'd take them and really hope that, that, that when they developed, that they developed well onto these photos that you'd go to Target and go get developed and you'd spend money on them. The world of today, photographs are free. And that has changed this upcoming six and seven year old generation where they see hundreds and thousands of pictures of themselves every single day. And they know to thumb through them on their iPad and go look at things and go look at what's going on. We've never had a generation that's done that before. This is a brand new thing. 
And so they're very used to exact representation of themselves and their friends, exact photonic representation. And so in each of those age groups, we have a transition in the way that communication happens between my parents, between my age group, between my daughter's age group, and between the six and seven year olds right now. And so communication will constantly continue to change. Avatar presence is acceptable today, you know, across the vast majority of age groups, not my parents. But coming up, people are gonna want much more accurate representation to represent the free photographs and the change that that is having on society. So often, I'll look at science fiction and say, science fiction will show us the way. It'll show us what's coming up. It showed us the cell phone, it showed us the tricorder. There was this, how many of you watched Star Trek in the 60s? This is the, the, there used to be a version in the 60s um, with Captain Kirk. And all communication to them was done on the bridge on a big screen. There they are talking to Abraham Lincoln. It, it, it was awesome. <laughs> and they're having a conversation. Two-dimensional screen. Huh. Let's move on to the 80s. Okay, still two-dimensional screen, but the screen is bigger. <laughs> if we look at Star Trek today, the screen is even bigger again, but now the picture is crap. <laughs> Digital integration did not go well. And so I start to look elsewhere. I start to look all over science fiction to see how people communicate in science fiction movies and television shows. And every single example is two-dimensional. All 2D. Except for one. <laughs> Lots. Moon. Except for Star Wars which represents everything three-dimensionally. From the very first scene in the original Star Wars, when Princess Leia is doing the hologram for R2-D2, to the hollow transmitters they have on their wrists, to the hollow pads they have in their rooms, to the, to, you know, to, to the 3D projection systems they use for the battlefields, to everything that they present, it's always 3D. Even in The Force Awakens, when they're looking at information on screens, that screen is three-dimensional. They consistently use three-dimensional imagery throughout all of the movies. It's the only example I've been able to find of, of hollow transmitters seem to be the, you know, the thing that every, sure, the picture's always lousy, but you know, it at least works. So it's interesting that science fiction is not shown as the true way forward there, except with Star Wars. So we will want to communicate with our families via mixed reality. And I want to think about each of those four generations that we actually have. So lastly, I think about information and what information is like. And here I, th I, th I tell people about what I call the five mile rule. And the five mile rule is this. I'm five miles away from my house and I've left my smartphone at home. Will I go back to my house and go get it? So how many of you will actually do that? Put your hands up. Because you need your smartphone, most of you. Um, as far as I can tell, the lights. Because I need my smartphone. I need my smartphone to communicate. I need it to tell me what to do. I need it for email. I need it for Twitter. I need it for Facebook. I need it for all these things that I do throughout the day. Heck, I can't even go to Starbucks without my phone. Because I use my phone to pay for the darn thing. Um, so my phone is a necessary part of, part of my life. It's become necessary. Now, how many of you wear a wearable like the Apple Watch? How many miles away would you go back to go get your Apple Watch if you forgot it? Or your Android Wear device, or your, your Fitbit? Five miles? You walked out of your bedroom? <laughs> you locked the front door? It's not very far. It certainly isn't five miles. And so what kind of information must we transmit in order to be seen as useful? What's that information that we, that we actually go and present to you where we're seen as like, oh, frick, I'm five miles away from my house. I've forgotten my device. I, I need to go back and get it. I can't go shopping with. I can't go meet with. I can't go pick up the airport with. I can't go to, to, to the office with. I can't go meet my friends without. What are each of those applications? 
and there's passive and active, passive and active applications for that, but you need to be thinking, we need to be thinking along that way for mixed reality and what mixed reality is actually going to mean. It certainly is not this. A year ago when you Googled um, um, augmented reality information, this was the picture that comes up. And this is a perfectly good shopping mall with lovely photons in it, with trees and things obscured by black banners, not really telling you any useful information at all. I mean, I guess it's telling you the Yelp reviews for those places and what they actually are. But I could guess that anyway from just looking at the picture that, that was below it. I would know that. And I have my own personal preferences over whether I want to go to Banana Republic or Gap Body. Banana Republic, by the way. Um, <laughs> as to actually go and buy clothes. I, you know, I'm not going to be influenced by, by others there and that, or you know, places to go eat or things. And that is not a way to present useful information. So this is also a way to get run over by a car. <laughs> and so I ask people all the time, what kind of information do you want from mixed reality? And the number one thing I hear always is, I want to see the person's LinkedIn profile right here. I want to see that. And yeah, that's true for maybe about a second. And then you want to have a better conversation. You want to have a better conversation with that person because you're wearing something from, you know, that, that has mixed reality in it. I want to be a better human. I want to in interact with you better. And the person you're having a conversation with has to think, thank God Graham's got on a mixed reality device because oh, holy crap, this hawk is now, my conversation with him is going to be 100 times better. Because it's like, the other side is, are you recording me? Because no, I'm not going to talk to you. That doesn't work. That's not an acceptable outcome. The only way is if the conversation is better. And so I think back to those GPS applications and those things about you know, temporal use of devices. For a second, yes, I do want to know names. I'm terrible with names, by the way. I do want to know your name. But then I want to move on to what we actually wanted to talk about. I want to look you right in the eye. I want to have a direct conversation with you. I want the photons that are added to the world to be incredibly useful to me. Because most of the time, in augmented reality applications, when photons are added to the world, it obscures the fantastic world in front of you for useless information, without meaning. And all that does is distract you. It doesn't make things better. And distraction is not very useful. And then there's this, which is going to happen. Advertising in mixed reality. There was recently a movie full of it and you know, just all sorts of things. And we as Magic Leap can choose to do two things here. We can hide our heads in the sand and say, advertising and mixed reality will never happen because we won't let it. Gosh darn it, that's a line. Never to be crossed. And that'll work for two months, month, week. And then there'll be advertising and there'll be banners. Or we can think hard about what advertising and what brand engagement is going to be like in mixed reality. And it's a very hard problem. It's incredibly hard. Apple came out on the stage and said, we're going to solve it for, you know, for iPads and iPhones. And they came up with banners that are animated. It wasn't a very good solution. So here I think about the solution being that line at Starbucks. And that line at Starbucks right now is exclusively smartphones. And everyone lines up, holding their smartphone together. And then they get to the, to the register, say what kind of drink they want. They show them the front of the smartphone so they can pay for their drink. And then you go wait for your drink and you still use your smartphone. You're still just looking at your own personal view. There was, there's opportunity in line to have you know, engagement in mixed reality with Starbucks so that I have some other opportunity you know, when I get to the register to have a better experience and then when I'm waiting to have a better experience. And that's easily possible. And so for me, kind of the line really is when I go to Starbucks and I see mixed reality being used well there, in line, at the register, waiting for my darn drink to come out, then I know that we've won. We've lost if it remains smartphones and it remains banner ads and it remains not, nothing interesting. But the worst thing we can do is to not think about it. And I hate thinking about advertising, it's not my thing. But I do think about it a lot and I think about that line at Starbucks and how much better it can be. So I will be more informed and aware of where I am and what I'm doing. It's key. 
So this, this sucks. This is the world we have today. People no longer live in the world. They go to concerts, and there is some guy here on stage singing his heart out, and there's a drummer, and there's other stuff. And everyone is watching this concert. Instead of engaging with the, you know, the, you know, everyone looking in the corner of the stage, watching people around you, having fun, they're looking at their phones above them to make sure they're capturing it properly. They're looking at this little four-inch screen when they're at a concert. There is one person in, in the bottom left that has got the heart up. <laughs> I like that person. And so I think about engagement in the world we have today and how messed up this is that people are no longer living in the moment. They're no longer living in the present. They're living for something that doesn't actually exist. They loved going to the concert, but they never actually saw it. And so we need to change that. We need to change that for mixed reality. Mixed reality needs to go forward and change that. There was another shocking image lately at a museum of people using cell phones. And here's, I think, that Rembrandt. And so I look at that because it's horrifying, right? It's like there is art history in front of you and they are all staring at the darn phones. Oh my gosh, what has society done? I should never have gone to Apple. I'm really sorry. That the <laughs> yeah, it's like it was just me. <laughs> but there's a little bit more to this story. Here's that same group actually interacting, learning, looking at things. So what were they doing here when they were looking at, at their phones? What were they actually doing? Well, it turns out they were all downloading and using an application that the museum makes to do a quiz their teacher had set out. And so a lot of what I hear around smartphones and education is that smartphones are ruining the world in front of us. And smartphones, you know, I think they are too, and I think they're terrible. But smartphones are occasionally doing something incredible as well. They are adding to the world around you. There are, that they are adding information to you directly. They are doing some interesting things. But surely it would be more interesting, instead of staring down at their iPhone, to look at the history of this thing and to learn more about it, to continue staring at that piece of history in front of them. Surely that is better. And so I think about what mixed reality is going to do there and how mixed reality is going to bring the classroom into the world. And so hopefully we've learned a little bit around mixed reality and what it means today. But that you know, becomes my dream. So some conclusions. People are first. And people are first two ways at Magic Leap. And I tell this to everyone coming into Magic Leap. Magic Leap is only made up of people, rocket scientists, opticians, science fiction authors, game designers. I'm just a guy with crayons. You know, there are people from NASA there. It's, it's, it's wacky, and they do magical things. So the people at Magic Leap are first. We have to maintain a, a culture going forward of fantastic people. But in everything Magic Leap ever does, the people of the world also come first. We are here to make humanity better. We're here to make humans better. We're here to make humans smarter. We're here to make life more enjoyable. We're here to make life better. So everything Magic Leap does must go towards that. Those things are very important to the company. What we do will be better, but not always new. There's two quotes, there's two things that, you know, around cars. So Henry Ford, he was quoted as saying, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And he came up with the production line, and everyone had cars, and it was awesome. Um, and cars are awesome. That was a completely new way of doing things. Then there's Elon Musk, who said, well, I'm just going to make a much better car. I'm going to make this cool electric car that goes really fast, that also looks really awesome, and has you know, all these awesome features to it that, that makes it look like it's from the future. And he also did something that was just better. And so a lot of the times, improving things that we've already got, improving the world as it is, improving things and making it better, is much better than bringing in something brand new. With mixed reality, it'd be very easy to just make the world crazy and go absolutely insane, and then no one would use it because there's no progression from where we're at to where we're going. And so I think a lot about making things better, 
making the atoms better, making the atoms, improving the, what, what's already there, adding to the world, making sure we understand the world in front of us, making sure we understand each other as humans, and improving that, making that much better. The experience really matters. People will line up at Best Buy or some store, I always say Best Buy, uh, for four days in the rain and the snow, in the sun, and you know, for an experience. We've seen this with phones, we've seen this with games, we've seen this with all sorts of things. So they will line up for a mixed reality experience that they think they will have, that they've never actually experienced yet, that, that they want to have. And the only thing that matters is the experience when you put the device on. The photons we present to you must be magical. They must be incredible. They must be something that you lust after that you think cannot, you can, your life cannot live without. My life will be so improved. I've seen the demos. My life will be so much better. The games will be awesome. My conversations with my parents will be so much better. My com I'll actually talk to my daughter again face to face. I will you know, be smarter because I'll suddenly know who everyone is. I, I'll suddenly know who's in all the Netflix shows. I'll be much better as a person, making things better, making that experience awesome. I think so much about that first experience and what mixed reality must do in order to be compelling. Han definitely shot first. <laughs> now, there's a few people at Magic Leap that disagree with me on this. And there's a few people that come into the company that I have to buy Star Wars for because they haven't seen it. And you have to watch Star Wars. <laughs> And it, it's amazing. Sometimes I don't want to watch it, and I have to force them. It's, it drives me nuts. <laughs> but mostly, you've got to have faith. Thank you.